Have you ever disguised yourself so people didn't recognize you? According to listverse.com, on VE Day, May 8, 1945, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret were permitted by King George VI to leave Buckingham Palace and join in the celebrations when Nazi Germany surrendered to the Allied forces. Sixteen members of the royal household were to accompany them in the biggest party in history. They left from one of the palace's back entrances and walked down the mall with everybody cheering and shouting this time to mark the end of the war instead of at the sight of royalty. Princess Elizabeth wore the uniform of the Auxiliary Territorial Service as she had been serving with them during the war, but Princess Margaret did not disguise herself, instead wearing glamorous clothes befitting her royalty. Their cousin Margaret Rhodes remembers them all entering the famous Ritz Hotel and joining a conga line to many raised eyebrows from the older ladies there. The party didn't return to the palace until 6 a.m. the next day. The Queen remembers it as being one of the most memorable nights of her life. The Incarnation is one of the most remarkable and surprising acts of God that this world could ever hope to experience. God becoming a man and dwelling amongst mere humanity is like the Queen going out disguised as a commoner except so much more profound and wonderful. There are many who struggle with the concept of Jesus being fully human and fully divine. And of course, the idea of God being a trinity has caused endless debate and much controversy. It calls for faith, as well as a careful examination of the scriptures for one to accept this doctrine and to believe it. There is a quote which I find helpful that was said by Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury from 1093. For I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe that unless I believe, I shall not understand. It's a bit like the justice system saying that a person should be presumed innocent unless proven guilty. Well-held beliefs should be accepted unless proved to be false. In today's world, however, there is a tendency to want to undermine authority and so treat all belief with skepticism. For many, Christian faith is seen as false, needing proof. And in this scientific world, a seeing-is-believing worldview treats faith with suspicion. In the popular song One of Us by Joan Osborne, this skepticism comes through in the questions she posed. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us? Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? In a sense, people generally don't have too much of a problem with the existence of the historical Jesus. There is ample evidence from contemporary writers such as Josephus for people to accept that Jesus was born and lived in Israel. There is enough evidence to make a case that he was a prophet or a moral teacher, a worker of miracles and even the leader of a religious sect. There would still be many who would say that Jesus died by crucifixion and still billions around the world today who believe that he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. But if you had to ask, is Jesus God? Even many Christians would not give an emphatic yes to that question. Yet this is the pivotal issue that distinguishes true believers in Jesus from those who see him as anything less than God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. If you struggle with the idea that Jesus is God, you're not alone. There was much debate in the early church as to the nature of the Messiah. How do you reconcile statements of Jesus such as, I and the Father are one? a statement that his hearers picked up stones to stone him to death for blasphemy, and then Jesus saying, If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. Early in the formation of the church, people came up with differing conclusions as to the divine nature of Jesus, trying to make sense of this radical claim of the Messiah's divinity. Various councils were called to deal with these issues, which resulted in a number of creeds which have guided Christian orthodoxy to this day. There is something special to stand amongst believers in worship and say together the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed with such emphatic statements of faith such as, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. 
When we are questioned about the divinity of Jesus, it is not some step away from reality into the realm of some deep, dark, unknown void we call faith. Rather, our belief is rooted in Scripture, both in the Old and New Testaments. Right from Genesis 3, when God came to address humanity after the fall, He promised that the seed of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent. This promised one would appear in many prophecies, some obscure that became clear only after the Messiah had been born and dwelt amongst us, and some quite clear, even though hard to grasp. One of those was in Isaiah 9, when the people walking in darkness would see a great light, when Israel would be under the yoke of oppression and their joy would return, because unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The hope is obvious, that a Redeemer would be born, the seed of the woman, one who would come from the tribe of Judah, a son of Abraham and a son of David, born into the royal line, a light to Israel and even to the Gentiles. But in the same breath as the birth of the child fixes his humanity, Isaiah then tells us his name. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. What? How can the human child be the Mighty God? But already Isaiah had revealed that the virgin would bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, or God is with us. Is it possible that a human could be God in disguise? For me, the best portrayal of the divinity wrapped in humanity is in the setup of the tabernacle. From the outside, this tent had no great beauty or majesty, but inside, a view that only the priests were allowed to see, its true beauty was illuminated. Outside, unremarkable animal skins covered and obscured the intricacy and glory of the materials that were hidden from sight. Much like Isaiah 53 would say that the Messiah would have no form or majesty or beauty to attract us to him. So the divinity of Jesus was not readily visible. Some would say, isn't this the carpenter's son? And would even mock, can anything good come from Nazareth? Yet John would reveal the truth. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We looked upon His glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, in the majestic mystery of God's plan to redeem a fallen humanity, God became man, to become humanity's substitute, to live a perfect life and die a perfect sacrifice for sin. As Paul would write to the Corinthian believers, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. In one sense, God hid his divinity when he came to be born as a baby in Bethlehem. But in another sense, this act was actually revealing the heart of the Father to a world who had lost touch with who Yahweh really is. The people walking in darkness could, in the appearing of the Son of God, see a great light, and the wonderful heart of the God of love is revealed to us in Jesus. If you have seen me, he said to a doubting Philip, you have seen the Father. As he healed the man born blind and declared, I am the light of the world, may he bring light to our eyes so we can see the glory of Jesus, mighty God and our Messiah. Light of light, very God of very God. Before the world was lost, you knew that we would fall. In spite of it all, you had the perfect plan. God became man Jesus came to the earth Saw through human eyes Died upon the cross And came back to life To save the souls of men Corrupted by sin Jesus will come back again Jesus will come back again No other man could live his life And never sin but 
Jesus will come back again. 